All right, we'll be in uh, multiple places as usual. If you want to, go ahead and turn to Genesis 5. That'll be the first major portion of Scripture I'll look at in Genesis chapter 5. As with, uh, I guess you could say, many other things today, there is a ton of confusion in the church, and in, in churches, and in, in the Christian church, as we know it, the body of Christ, uh, people are confused on a lot of topics, theologically speaking. And one of the things, you know, I ran into, I've told the story a lot, but obviously, you know, once you live through something, that experience becomes something you just constantly are reminded of, I suppose, when it's something like this. I remember being at Midwestern over in Kansas City, and I remember I was starting to study eschatology a lot. And I literally was rebuked by a lot of people over and over again. People were like, why are you wasting your time on that? What are you even studying, you know, the end times for us, you know? And, it, and their idea was nobody can really know. You can't figure it out. It's a puzzle that's, un, you know, undiscernible. And it's a total waste of your time, essentially, to study prophecy. That is essentially what people have in their minds at these higher levels, quote, higher levels of learning. Uh, they think it's the high road to just say, you know, throw your hands up, we can't figure this kind of stuff out. And this was in specific to, to eschatology. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of conversations with people, and I, it was real to me how confused people were on this particular subject. And, that, and I was confused. And, you know, there's some things that still confuse me. And there's things I've been wrong about multiple times. I've been here and there and everywhere. And prophecy is not easy. And studying what the Bible has to say with it is probably one of the hardest things in the Bible. Because, first off, the Bible, one-third or so of the Bible is prophetic. Yes. I mean, the vast, uh, you can almost say the majority of scriptures, uh, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, that are prophetic in nature almost would be a half the Bible if you took historic context and whatnot in place. A lot of the Bible is prophetic. When I say prophetic, I don't mean just in the generic uh, to speak forth truth. I mean to speak forth future truth, to tell the future in essence. And that actually, the Bible says, God actually told people one time, oh, you know, you believe in that false God? Can they tell you the future? Can they predict what's going to happen? And uh, by the way, these Calvinists jump on that and say, God don't just know the future, he makes it happen. Hmm. Well, that's a lie. God don't make all evil things happen. Knowing the future is a big deal. Can you tell the future? I can. Knowing the future is a big deal. It means you're God. Uh, yet these people try to jump onto that fact and say, he don't just know it, he makes it happen. Well, he makes some things happen. He don't make everything happen. And he does know the future. And that actually is a test to see if it's from God or not. Yep. A false prophet in the Bible would be someone who rightly told the future. If they spoke something and it was not to be uh, the case, you were to stone that, that false prophet and they were to be killed because it was it was proven because they did not know the future that they were a false prophet. You know, how interesting is that today? What if we did that with everybody that was just so far off base on the end times <laughs> that you just stoned every false prophet? There would be a lot of Christians getting stoned today. So, you know, that, that's another reason we're in the age of grace, as you heard Jack refer to. You know, it's a, we're in a lot easier time to live in it's not as hard on us in that sense. We don't we don't have that law hanging over us where you know you slip up like that, you're dead. And there was a lot of laws going on back then that, that, that we don't obviously apply today. Now, the people have, have messed up on end times. That's what I'm getting to. There's confusion out there. There's a lot of people off base. And what I want to talk about this morning, the title of the sermon is The Reality of the Rapture. Okay? And I didn't plan on doing multiple parts until I actually did the study. And I was like, well, I don't want to preach for an hour and a half, you know, two hours. So it's going to have to be multiple sermons. And actually can get multiple sermons on this. Um, the, the, the topic of the rapture is deeper biblically than you might realize. And so first I want to kind of introduce the subject in this way. Why, what, what's people confused about? You know, you might ask, well, what's the confusion? Well, when you talk about the rapture, there's confusion on multiple points. I'm not going to cover the first one, which is the timing. At another point, I will. Uh, this is this isn't the sermon to cover the timing, but I would say number one, when we talk about the issue of the rapture, and this is somewhere I've been confused on a lot because it's not easy, is the timing of the rapture. When is the rapture? And you have these different rapture positions within Christianity. You have a pre-tribulational rapture, 
you have a mid-tribulational rapture, you have a post-tribulational rapture, then you have a pre-wrath rapture, and then you have a partial rapture theory, and then you have some people that don't even believe in rapture at all. Uh, the last one, obviously, would be full-blown heresy that I would say is not even Christian uh, because then you're denying the resurrection. Um, all the other ones, the partial rapture theory, I would also probably consider heresy. That idea, if you ever heard of the partial rapture theory, that idea is that um, only a select few people, even though they're saved, only a select few get raptured. Everybody else just has to go through the tribulation. And what they'll do is they'll yank some verses out of context. You know, are you watching for the Lord? You know, are you are you longing for his coming? If you're not, if you're not doing good works by the time Jesus comes, he's gonna let you go through the tribulation. And they'll they yank a few verses and twist them and teach that kind of nonsense. It's called the partial rapture theory. There's another one known the, known as the mid tribulational theory. It it basically has faded away. Almost nobody believes in this. There's almost no scripture to support the mid tribulation. What they did is they took what I used to hold to was as the pre wrath rapture. They take some verses and they say, well, we can tell a lot of stuff happens at the midpoint, so it must happen then. It's just, it's really kind of a, a dumbed down, stupid view, in my opinion. The mid tribulation rapture, no precedent at all. Then you get to the, uh, at the post tribulation rapture view. You know, you, somebody says, well, I'm confused. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a confusion on the timing of the rapture, there's confusion on the topic of the rapture. The post tribulation view says, that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation period. The final seven years that happen before the millennial kingdom, they say the rapture happens at the very end of that. The problem with that is many, you know, who goes into the kingdom? Because as I, as we studied, if you remember near the sheep go judgment, all the unbelievers are thrown in hell, right? And if, you, if you study Revelation 19 and 20, when Jesus returns, the rest are killed. So all the unbelievers are killed and thrown in hell, and only believers go in the little kingdom. So if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, who's going to populate the kingdom? Who's going to make babies that live to be over 100 years old? If they die at 100, they're, young, they're dying as young. They're playing with copperheads. You know, they're playing with snakes. Mm -hmm. Who's doing these things? You see, there, there is no way. And this is the problem. This is the issue. When you, when you talk about the timing of the rapture, when you talk about the nature of the rapture, the nature of end times prophecy, the number one thing that people mess up on is they don't account for all the Bible. They'll find a view that accounts for one verse, or they'll find a view that accounts for two or three verses, or they'll be confused on one particular section of Scripture, and that will guide them down a certain path of error. That's happened to me. And you see, the thing is, you have to find a, a position that accounts for everything, that accounts for the, the totality of Scripture. The last, the last view, other than the pre-tribulational view, is the one that I used to hold to even until more recently. Uh, I would say I started changing my mind on it maybe about a month, two, three months ago. And it was known as the pre-wrath rapture. It's a modified version of the mid-tribulational rapture where at some undisclosed point in time after the midpoint, Jesus returns and you know raptures the church. But then he pours out his wrath. And it, you know the, that, that view appealed to me mainly because God's wrath. I know. I, I know. As Christians, you're not going to suffer God's wrath. I mean, that's evident, right? And so uh, that avoided the wrath part. That, that solved the dilemma of who goes into the kingdom. But then, you know, the preacher of relational theory. When you talk about the time, and it comes along, it holds. A, it has a whole host of uh, verses that it actually comes along and it fills the gap in need and understanding. And like I said, I'm not going to go into the to the sermon that I plan on doing one day on you know these different rapture views because those would be the two in my view that hold the most uh you know weight behind them obviously you know i've been persuaded now and i lean to the preacher view i believe that i believe that that view is a scriptural view but i, I you know in the back of my mind i still have some level of respect for the other view because i used to hold that and you know that's just the way it is uh, i can't i can't help that i have that confusion in me now my goal is to not have other people in confusion. You know, when you when you take scripture and you study the Bible, there's some things you look at, you can look at it from multiple perspectives, right? And you're looking at this and you're saying, well, I see this and yet I see this. And you can become confused. Well, that's happened to me in a lot of areas. I don't want that for other people. I want to clear up the confusion before it ever happens. You see? And so it, it, you don't want to be able to see the Bible two or three different ways everywhere. 
That's one th- one point in time I wanted to do that, and I no longer want to do that because it just makes your head hurt. Okay, so you don't want to see two or three different perspectives everywhere you go. Well, so what about this issue of the reality of rapture? Well, you got this one group of people within Christianity that are confused on the timing of the rapture, right? That's 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 a good debate to have. That's an important debate to have. And that's one, you know, I'm going to kick the can down the road and I'll nail that in the end later on. But today I want to talk about this other group of people within so-called Christianity. I call them so-called because you're going to see real quick where they actually make fun of the rapture. You see, so it's not like they're arguing about the timing. They will just make fun of it straight out. And you say, well, what do they say? What do they do? Well, you know, you ever watch any of the Left Behind movies? You know, the one with Nicolas Cage in it. Or you got the, the older one with Kirk Cameron in it. I know I watched it. I remember watching that with Ashley, you know, when we was dating. I think we watched multiple of them, you know. And at the time, we thought they was pretty cool movies. Now people just make fun of that. Oh, how, how silly, they say. That's so stupid. Are you, you believe in that? They say you believe that, you know, people's going to be flying planes. And, you know, in these movies, it's just like every plane's hitting the ground. And every car's running into a building. And there's piles of clothes laying everywhere. You believe in that silly stuff? Now, here's the first thing. Do you really think there's that many Christians? <laughs> I mean, if, if the rapture were to take place today, and we all vanish today in Big Stone, how many people would really be gone? I mean, it, it really is interesting to think about, isn't it? Now, I apply that to the whole world. Now, you, people's going to notice, and there is a lot of Christians on earth. Yeah. People are going to notice. But first off, do you really think it's going to be that many that every plane in the air is going to fall out of the sky? I, I don't even know how many pilots are even saved. Maybe one, two, three, a dozen in the whole world. Now, how many planes are in the air right now? Can't be hundreds. There ain't that many. So out of, let's say there's 200 plane, planes in the air right now. How many of those people are even saved? Maybe none of them. I mean, my goodness. So... First off, people get these, this movie stuff in there, and that's fine. That is possible, because if you were raptured and you were flying a plane, that plane's going down. Now, ain't nobody flying that thing. But you see, they get these fanciful, you know, over-the-top ideas in their head, and then they start, oh, you think you're just going to vanish. Oh, you think, you know, you're just going to be caught away. That's so silly. And they start mocking the Bible. I've heard people do it many a times, many times. They mock the idea of a rapture. Now, here's the thing. The Bible teaches it. It really will happen. You, you know, you might say, oh, it's just so silly. You're going to think you're going to vanish. You think you're going to just disappear. And all the Christians are just going to disappear. Uh, the Bible says it's going to happen. Before you blaspheme the Lord and his word, you need to understand it is clearly taught in the Bible. And this is something that I noticed a while back. And that's why I told you to go to Genesis 15. That not only when we talk about the timing, that there's verses that mandate, you know, the timing. For example, in, in John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. By the way, that's blasphemy if he ain't God. I mean, can you imagine me saying that? You know, hey, Dad, don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me too. Well, what in the world? You say, uh, no, I'm believing in the Lord. You're not the Lord, right? Well, Jesus tells them, hey, you believe in God? Believe in me too. That's equality with the Father, by the way. Yeah. And he goes on to say, in my Father's house are many mansions. Yeah. And I believe I believe the King James translators are fine to say mansions there. People want to say, you can go to the Greek and it's just rooms. And I guess there's just the biggest hotel on earth up there in heaven or something with just a million little baby rooms in it or something like that. But why don't we just like you know allow these people to translate the word that knew Greek better than any of these people pretend. Like I heard a preacher one time say, oh, <laughs> it was hilarious. He's like, oh, my Greek's better than my Hebrew. He didn't know Greek. He didn't know Greek at all. I was telling Ashley about this other day. He says, my Greek's better than my Hebrew. He don't know He don't know Greek or Hebrew. Didn't take none of it. I took more than him. These people, are, they, they're full of themselves. So let's let, you know, these, you know, what, 50, 60, how many scholars there was, I forget, on the King James Committee, these you know dozens of you know people that actually spoke Greek that translate this mansions. Let's just let it stand in mansions. You're going to get a gigantic mansion. I don't know why you'd want to take a mansion and turn it into an apartment, but you know Jesus says, "Hey, in my Father's house, there's many mansions." You say, "Well, a house doesn't have mansions in it; it has rooms." House being heaven. 
heaven. You see, my father's house will be heaven. In heaven, there's many mansions. And I, I, I kind of like that too. It gives me more space. You know, I'm kind of a, a <laughs> private person anyways. I'm not as social as other people. I don't want to be right, you know, one one wall away from every single person in the, in the history of humanity that's been saved. Anyways, listen to what he says. If it were not so, I would have I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, listen, I will come again, he says, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. When does that happen? When does that happen? If it's at the end of the tribulation period, the post trib rapture is impossible. I mean, that's just that's silly. He said, What's he gonna do? Well, oh, hey, look at your mansion. Come right back down. I mean, you won't be there at all. There's no time, you see? And so there has to be a time period for this. And there's verses that clear up confusion in it like that. That's one way I would show somebody that post-trib rapture is impossible. You cannot, when does that happen? He went and prepared a place for you for you to never be there? That's ignorant. But you say, well, after that, after he returns, you know, well, then you're on the earth in little kingdom. Then he destroys it and he destroys the heaven and makes a new heaven and new earth. So when are you there in the place he prepared? Never, you see? So for this scripture to be fulfilled, there has to be a rapture prior to at least the post-trib rapture, you see? That view is just eliminated. That view is eliminated on the basis of who goes in the little kingdom. That view is the most impossible view. The, po the purely post-trib rapture is the most impossible view. The confusion can be cleared up by just knowing the Bible. Now, it can be, uh, the confusion can be cleared up too when we talk about this issue of mocking the Bible, mocking the rapture, you know, is there a rapture at all? And I guess you could say the nature of the rapture is what we're going to talk about. The nature of the rapture. Because what is the rapture? You ever thought about that? You've heard people talk about the rapture, the rapture, the rapture. What is a rapture? So we're going to talk about that a little bit deeper today and hopefully keep people from blaspheming God, mocking this event that is going to take place. Because I, I propose to you that not only is this event, the rapture, going to happen in the future, I propose to you there's been raptures already, essentially. And I'm going to show you that. You don't. Yep. Genesis chapter 5, look at verse 18. And Jared lived 100, 160 and 2 years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived, after he begat Enoch, 800 years, and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Jared were 962 years. That's a long time to live in. Yep. Now, that is, by the way, what I believe the Middle Kingdom would be like. I believe the conditions, when you had the, they call it the antediluvian. You hear, you hear someone say antediluvian, it means pre-flood. That's all it means. It's just a fancy way of saying pre-flood, right? I believe the conditions prior to the flood were pretty much pristine. You had a perfect environment, right? And sin entered the world and starts corrupting that. And then the flood happens and, you know, we're far from Eden now, right? But when God, when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom, it talks about him restoring things. He's going to restore the earth to this endemic uh, pre, uh, I guess you could say, antediluvian or pre-flood condition. And that's why, we, you know, the sun right now, you ever wonder why you wrinkle the sun? You know, your, your skin, break, your body breaks down. You know, the Bible talks about they will run and not grow weary. Why do you get tired when you run? It has to do with the oxygen in your blood and how much, how much you're getting when you breathe in and whatnot and how much your body can pump through. Well, what if you have per perfect atmosphere and perfect conditions in all these things? You see, your body will actually function differently and you would not die as soon. That's why people live to be as old. The, the, the environment was perfect. And you see, some people come along today in science and they'll say, no, it never was that way. It's always been bad like it is now and, you know, all this stuff. But here's the thing. In Second Peter 3, it says that people are going to come along and be scoffers like that, saying that things have always been the same as they were from the beginning. But they haven't always been the same. There's been different times throughout history where things have been different. That goes into dispensations. God has worked with man at different points of times differently, and the earth has been in different conditions at different times, and, and it will be again in the future. And so that's one reason why these people are living to be 960. 960 is a pretty long time. I mean, I'm, I'm 34 now, and, I, and it feels like a long time. I mean, I can't imagine if I'm 60 or 70, if, ever, if the Lord allows me to live that long, 
That would feel like a long time. And I would be willing to bet by the time I hit like 100, if I was a, I'd be like, well, I'm ready to go to heaven. <laughs> you know, my body's breaking down. And ever, I mean, once you hit 100, that's a, that's a feat, isn't it? But at the same time, I'd have to think, you'd also be ready to just go home. Go be with the Lord because you can't walk at that point. You can't move. I mean, once you get to the point where your body breaks down so much, hey, let's go be with the Lord. You know, that's the way I think I would feel. And your family's done grown. grown. I would have, like, great grandkids by that point. I mean, it's just there comes a time when you move on. There's a time for this and a time for that. And I'd like to think, but these people live 960 years. So they're seeing their great, 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 great grandkids. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's an amazing thing. And, and you know, that goes to this point that I was going to bring up later. I was bring it up now. There's a mind that comes at this stuff, and they'll say, I don't believe that. Do you believe a guy lived 900 years? I don't believe that. That's, that's too miraculous. That's too crazy. And at the same time, that same person believes they come from a frog. <laughs> they evolved from an amoeba. Oh, you believe you live 900 years? You're crazy, you know. But I think we all come from cosmic sludge. Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Like, they'll, they'll readily believe that nonsense, that my ancestor is a monkey. But they won't believe a dude lived to be 900. Okay. You know, you tell me which one's more insane. But anyways, I don't want to get too far off track. Let me get to the point here. Verse 21, Genesis chapter 5. And Enoch lived six, 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And now here's where it gets interesting. I don't, I, don't, I don't really have any notes to guide what I'm going to say here. I know what I want to say. So hopefully I stay slightly on track. But this gets really, really interesting. When you look into the names here, you know, uh, God will judge. You know, it's almost as if when Methuselah dies, the flood comes. And if you look at Methuselah's name, it's really interesting. Yeah. You know, it, it seems like there's more going on here behind the scenes, like God works this out to a T in a particular yeah. way. But I, I think there's even more going on there, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but there's some symbolism, I believe, going on here. I think it's a literal event. Don't get me wrong. I think these people really did exist. This is history. But I think God worked this out in a way to show us something, and I'm going to get to that. Now look in verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. So this guy, it says he walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. You know, you, you got these old-time Christians, and they, they, they proudly and rightly so say, you know, I've been saved 40, 50 years, right? Jack's one of those people. Hey, I've been saved 50 years. I've been serving the Lord. I've been preaching for you. But through, you know, this guy here, come, Enoch come along, he say, ah, 300. <laughs> I've been studying the Bible for 300 years. I've been walking with God for 300 years. You know, he, he's got everybody beat on the earth. This, this guy knew the Lord. He walked with the Lord. And look what it says in verse 23. All the days of Enoch were 365 years. And that's interesting, too, if you think about it. Maybe at age 65 he got saved. You see how it says he walked with the Lord 300 years, yeah. but he lived 365 years? Yeah. And so that, that's just a testimony there. It ain't never too late to start walking with the Lord. Uh, which I guess you can make an argument too. At sixty-five, uh, he's about what one-sixth away through his life. Yeah. So today that would equate to about ten years old. <laughs> so kind of went back on that one. He's basically ten or twelve years old in, in our time. It's almost like dog years and pre pre flood years, I guess you could say. But yeah. Anyways, look look what it says there, in verse twenty-four. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's right. You see that. Obviously, you know, I had like 20 caveats and side things I talked about because I just love talking about the different things in the Bible. But let's get back to the point here. The confusion that people have on the rapture. Oh, you think people's just going to just vanish. Oh, you think, you know, that's just so silly. I just can't wrap my mind around it. Is that really going to happen? You know, even Christians probably get to the doubting. Is that really going to happen? Is one day, am I just going to be sitting in my living room watching Fox News and then all of a sudden, I'm gone. Right. Could that happen? Is that really something that could happen? Could I just could we all right now just literally vanish? Is that I mean, do you you ever ask yourself, is this even possible? And people, and I, you know, I understand somebody doubting this. Let me encourage you to believe the Bible this morning. This word was not. You see that there in, in verse twenty four. Literally means was nothing. So you you can read that. It says Enoch walked with God. And then he didn't exist. 
or then he was no more. Nothing. So it's just like, imagine a guy just walking along, he doesn't, no more. He just vanished. That's what it means. That's what the word literally means. And it says, for God took him. Yeah. I want to show you how, how, how this is, because we're going to go to some scriptures here in a second that you're going to see are direct parallels to this. It says, for God took him. So it's telling you why he was not. So here's Enoch walking along, walk with the Lord, living his life. He vanishes. For God took him, is what the Bible said. Now the word took, you know what it means? Now I didn't make this up. I looked them all up on, on a, a lexicon or whatnot on the internet there. This, this is what the word means. They don't have, these people all looked up, they don't have a preacher of you bone in their body, okay? They're all Calvinists, all these people behind these commentaries, these days, they're Calvinists, they're Reformed, they're covenant theologians, they don't believe in a future for Israel. They probably don't even believe in a rapture. So they didn't have any, you say some biased information here. I just actually read the Bible, they don't. So they don't realize, they get, they're just like proving themselves wrong. The word means seized or be carried away. Okay, that's what it would mean. When it says took him, it means he was walking with God. He was living his life with the Lord. Then he vanished because God seized him. You get it? Snatched, seized, carried away. That's what it says, seized him. All right, so let's walk around the Bible here a little bit now. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at a, a, another reference to this. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews toward the back of the Bible after 1st and 2nd Timothy. I'll give you a second to get there if you want to. And if you want to get ahead of the curve, you can go to 1st Corinthians 15. That's where we'll go after this. So we're going to look at some scriptures now. This, remember, this has been Genesis 5. We didn't have to get far into the Bible to find a rapture. Genesis 5, Enoch is raptured, okay? Spoiler, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, that's a rapture. He is, he is raptured. By definition, that is the rapture. Not the rapture future, but a rapture, rather. And so I want to show you some scriptures to prove that point. Don't just take my word for it. Never just take a preacher's word for stuff. Okay? Don't just listen to somebody and say, well, I, you know, because he said it. He's just such a great person. Or I just like the way he sounds. John Hagee has such a great voice. I must believe everything he says. You know, that's, what, that's one of the problems with Christians today. They just believe everything a man says. The, the reason you bring a Bible to church is so you can check what I'm saying. Right. You don't just believe everything someone says. All right, Hebrews 11. If you ain't there yet, you ain't never going to. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 5. This is what's known as the hall of faith, right? By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death so that rules out that liberal view back here in Genesis. Well, you know, the Bible just said he was not. That just means he died. Uh, no, the author in the New Testament said he didn't see death. Okay? So, you know, all these liberals, they want to pop up with some nonsense to try to explain away the things they don't really believe in the Bible. That's really what it is. These people come to the Bible and they don't believe it for what it says. So they just try to explain it away with some naturalistic garbage. No, I'm sorry here. It says that he should not see death. He didn't die. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. Translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony right. that he pleased God. The word translated obviously means to transfer, to change. God changed him. And this is where it gets really interesting again. Why did God do that? Why does the text say that he, God did that? Because of his faith. Look what it says in verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Yeah. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'll tell you that today. That's the same thing today. You cannot please the Lord without faith. It takes faith. And you know what? God will work in your life in a way to ensure that your faith grows, as hard as that might be, as much as you might struggle. And I, I've heard it likened to this, and I think it's a proper illustration. You know, when you're a kid, mommy and daddy's holding your hand, ain't they? But they ain't always holding your hand. And God, you know, when you're first saved and you're walking, it's such a close walk, and you're walking on clouds, and it's easy. But then that hand, he ain't holding your hand no more. And he allows you to go through trials and tribulations and struggles to build your character, to grow your faith. Yes. It's like having Michael at the pool the other day. You know, 
we had to make him jump in. He about threw a hissy fit and cried on the side to do it. But once he did it once, he was able to do it more. It was easier to jump in. His faith grew. We had to put him through that for him to see that he could do that. And a lot of times God allows a Christian to go through a trial or struggle to show and to encourage them and bolden them in their faith. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Now, how is that a rapture? How is this a rapture? You still might not be persuaded. Well, just note the things that that I'm pointing out in in these verses, right? Remember now in Genesis 5. Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. He vanished. He just disappeared, okay? And it says, for God took him. God seized him. Now we come over here to Hebrews 11, and it says that Enoch was translated. That word means changed, right? Now let's go over here to 1 Corinthians 15. This is, this is how you prove doctrines. This is how you prove things in the Bible. You go to Scripture after Scripture. You use sound reason and logic and biblical interpretation. You compare Scripture with Scripture, spiritual with spiritual, and you prove a point. You don't just say, well, I think in my, I just think this, or I always heard this, or I just don't make sense to me. Well, you, you're God in your own eyes, if that's the case. But I, I go to the Bible, what the Bible says, I believe. Best I can, at least. And if I don't believe something there, I, I confess it as sin. Because that's what it would be. You struggle to uh, understand or, or to believe something in Scripture, you need to confess that to the Lord, and the Lord might actually open your eyes to that. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. And that right there, if anybody ever wanted to know, that is the catalyst for me changing my rapture view. That right there verse is, is the one thing that really led me to change my mind on the timing of the rapture. Um, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Right. Now, what do we say that happened to Enoch in, in, in Hebrews 11? Remember, he was translated. The word translated means changed. You see? Now, here Paul's telling us as, as the church, we're not all going to sleep. Now, what happened in, in Hebrews 11? Remember what happened with Enoch? It said he did not see death. That's what Paul's saying here. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to see death. So just like Enoch didn't die, not all Christians will die. Just like Enoch was changed, all Christians will be changed. So we won't all sleep, but we shall all be changed or translated. You say, well, what are we changed into? What's that about? Given a new body. Given a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, when's that? In a moment. Yeah. In the twinkling of an eye yeah. at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed or translated. Same thing. It's the same, it's the same concept, same words, same meanings at least. And so, same thing happened to Enoch, same thing that happened to the church. That's very clear, it's very straightforward. You're changed, you're translated in a moment of time, instantaneous transformation. You know, it's interesting because, it, remember, it goes back, all these scoffers and people that mock the Bible, essentially, they think they're mocking the pre-trip rapture, but the rapture is going to happen regardless where you put it, okay? If the pre-trip view was wrong, it's still going to happen. Sometime, you got to put it somewhere. This rapture event, so don't don't try to say, well, I just disagree with pre-trib or I just don't believe that timing. It doesn't matter if, for this case what timing you put. This will happen. This event, these scriptures, we're not talking about when it's going to happen yet, but this event will happen. And it will be like this. You understand that what I'm saying? It will be this way. A moment, instantaneous. So when someone mocks you, know, oh, you think you're going to vanish. <laughs> You just think you're just going to teleport somewhere. Yeah, I do. I do. I do believe that. Because the Bible said that. The Bible says not every Christian will see death. Some of them will literally be translated instantaneously to meet the Lord in the air and to go back to heaven with him in a resurrection body. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Can you imagine not having to die? I mean, that's one of the things everybody hates. They dread looking death in the face. They they know death's coming, you know. Death is stalking them. Death is stalking every person. And we hate death. 
Death is unnatural. Did you know that? Did you know death is unnatural? Why is it universally mourned and grieved and hated? Only the weirdest people in society do you look at and they say, death's awesome. Those people are freaks. Those people are weirdos. You say, what's wrong with you? You love death, you morbid weirdo. Most people hate death. Most people grieve and mourn death, do they not? You know why? It's unnatural. It's counter to us. Made in the image of God, we look at death as something we hate. We don't want that. And the Bible describes it as the last enemy that is to be defeated. I mean, even in the same passage, I'll go ahead and read it here. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's a caveat I would make, for mainly for people probably listening and people being here today to be saved. Because here's the thing. Death will come to all people. Death is coming. And unless this rapture happens, even Christians will see death. Yep. But there is a way out. There is a way to achieve victory even in defeat, as you might say. Even as in death, we would see his defeat, right? And, oh, we've lost somebody today. But if you're a Christian, that loss turns into gain. You gain heaven. Yeah. You know, you begin to look at life with spiritual eyes and everything changes. You ever thought, you know that? You, you say, well, what's the purpose of life? Why are we here? Well, if it's to do what most people are doing, this life really does stink. Mm -hmm. Gathering wealth just to lose it. Gathering friends just to lose them. Because ain't nobody living forever. Right. They're going to be gone. Gathering money. Naked you came, naked you go. If that's what life's about, life does stink. Life is morbid. Life is a, a horrible thing to, to, to try to think about and, and to live out. You say, well, I hate this life. I hate what it's about. That ain't what life's about. Life's about souls. Primarily, your soul. Life's about the God who made you. That's right. Who wants you to worship him. Amen. Who made you for a, a point and a purpose. Right. Who, who made you to come into relationship with him. Right. Who, who is reaching out his arms to you and saying, come, you know, be my child. Be, be forgiven of this sin. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This earth is not the way it's supposed to be. The rape and the murder and the crime and, and the filth and the, the disgusting things that go on. And, and all, the, all the death and corruption... This ain't the way that God wants it to be. Right. You say, well, why don't he fix it? If he fixed it, we would all be dead. If he wanted to vanquish sin, you sin. I sin. He will do it one day. Yeah. But that's that's future. And you say, well, why don't he do it now? We'll read 2 Peter 3. He's, he's long-suffering. Not willing the end should perish, but all should come to repentance. Right. So the reason he don't come today and put an end to your hard times and your troubles and everything you struggle with is the same reason he didn't come yesterday. Because he wants you to be saved. Right. And he wants, to, he wants your neighbor to be saved. Right. And you look at this world through spiritual eyes, and you realize it ain't about your mundane, everyday job, your everyday life, or whatever you do with your free time. That's side things. That's a waste. That's wood, hay, and stubble. Yeah. It's an eternal mindset that we need to get. And I think that's one of the problems. People do not have, a, have spiritual eyes today. They're not thinking about things through the lens of the Bible and therefore, when they think about a rapture, they don't even want to go in a rapture. I don't want Jesus to return right now. You know, I missed the ball game tonight. Like, are you kidding me? Can you, can you believe? You know? But then guess what? You're going to get sick. You want a rapture then, don't you? <laughs> you get terminally ill, you're going to want a rapture real quick, wouldn't you? You see? And so you take in the goodness of God that's given you a good life. He's given you good things. He's given you luxuries. And you're actually spurning his love. You're not longing for his return. You're not looking to see people saved. He's giving you those good things, and you're focusing on the gift rather than the giver. Mm -hmm. and, and Christians, more than anybody, needs to turn back to the Lord and look on the Lord and say, God, thank you for what you've given me. I'm going to do a little something for you now. Amen. We need to look at things with spiritual eyes and, and not this naturalistic thing that's been pressed into us. I'll close on this next one here. There's, there's more that I want to say. Uh, I guess I'll kind of get to this a little bit quicker. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4 with me if you want to. If not, I'll read it. 
First Thessalonians 4. This is really the primary rapture passage right here in First Thessalonians 4. This is the main rapture passage, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to start at verse 16 and 17, midway through him talking about this. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. People who are already dead, they're buried. Now remember in Corinthians it said, people alive at that time, they ain't all going to see death, right? So first, people who are dead, it says rise. Then... We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now note this, a big distinction. He don't come to the earth here. It says you meet the Lord in the air. But in Zechariah, he's, in 14, he's putting his feet down on the Mount of Olives. Yep. That ain't happening here. Some people want to confuse the second coming with the rapture. It ain't the same thing. You believe in two second comings. No, I believe in the rapture. I believe in the second coming. The Bible describes two different events yeah. and not the same way. You confuse those two, it's going to confuse your, your eschatology. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see? Where at? In the mansion he prepared for you that I read earlier in John 14. You're going to spend several years in heaven, seven, in heaven, then you're going to return with Christ back to the earth. You're never going to leave Christ's side. Jesus is not going to be, you know, away from you at some point. He's with you in heaven. He's, you're with him when he returns. He makes new heaven and new earth. You're with him there. We shall ever be with the Lord. Now, a couple of things to point out here to prove my point further that Enoch was raptured and to prove that this rapture is a real deal. It is a real thing. And there's been raptures in history. I'll show you more next time, Lord willing. And there's going to be a future event known as the rapture of the church in the future. You see? But what I'm trying to show you is this rapture idea. You see, I heard people say, there's no rapture in the Bible. I listened to people last night. I looked up a couple people. You know, what is R.C. Sproul? You know, he's, he's dead, and, and I believe that hopefully in heaven now. He was a hardcore Calvinist. But I hold out hope he was saved. You know, uh, he had some, some good things to say. Uh, I hate that he fell in all that nonsense. But, you know, R.C. Sproul was like, you know, do you believe in a rapture? And he makes fun of the rapture. And then you hear this other, other guy, Andrew Womack or whatever his name is. And I think I prayed for his death one time in Kansas City as I listened to him teach heresy on TV. Uh, that's like the only guy I've ever prayed in precatory psalm over. Uh, just throwing that out there. Same guy, I think his name's Andrew Womack. I've seen him on YouTube. And the question is, is there a rapture? In first words, no. No, I don't believe in a rapture. And he just goes on and on giving his nonsense. This is the way that people answer the question these days. Well, you know, that rapture you've always been taught, that's not true. It's, you know, it's just the second coming of Jesus. No, it ain't. It's not the same thing. It is not the same thing. Jesus' second coming, touching down on earth, setting up his kingdom, is not the same event as a rapture. And if you do that, you just annihilated John 14, 1 to 3. You just annihilated, uh, you know, the millennial kingdom and, and who goes into it. You see, they're unstable, they're unlearned. They don't know the scriptures, and so they twist them to their own destruction. Yeah. They twist them, and they, and they inevitably make the Bible contradict themselves. Look here in verse 17, this word, you see here it says, caught up. Now, I'm not going to try to pretend to know Latin, but I'll, I can tell you a little bit on, on, on the history of this. You say, because he sent me, I brought the naysayers because what they'll say is rapture ain't found nowhere in the Bible. That word rapture ain't about, you know what, they're right. Rapture, the word, is not in the King James. But this word here is, this word called caught up. Yeah. Now, you remember in Genesis 5, what happened to Enoch? God took him, right? God took him, seized him, okay? Now, here it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, that the Christians alive on planet Earth at this time will be caught up. Right. This this word in the Latin Vulgate was translated as uh, like basically harpizo, okay, rapizo. It's it's it means to seize or snatch away. The word in English comes from basically a transliteration of the Latin rapture. 
That's where they're getting it from. You see? And if you think about, you know, has anybody ever used the word rapture outside of a biblical context today? If they do, what does it mean? Oh, my soul, my spirit's just raptured. You know, I'm raptured in this moment. It means you're called up in something, right? You're called away. That's all rapture means, to be called up or called away. So you, these people harp on, oh, rapture's not even in the Bible. You big silly pre-tribber. You know, here's the thing. Caught up is in the Bible, and it means the same thing. Enoch was took. He was caught up. He was seized. The church will be caught up and be seized. That's what it means here. He, that, that those who are on earth will be caught up. So if you just look at those, and I, you know, I'm running out of time here, but if you just look at those, you'll note the similarities easily. It's not hard to see the similarities, is it? And I think that this is one of the greatest proofs that the rapture is not only a biblical concept, but it's a great proof and confidence to us that just as he did this before, he'll do it again. And he did it with one person before, he'll do it with millions next time. You say, well, that's crazy. You know, why would God teleport millions, perceivably millions of Christians all at once? That's just too big a miracle for me to imagine. Well, oh, ye of little faith, wait and see. Wait and see. The Lord's able to do that. He made heaven and earth. You think he can't translate you? He breathed, he breathed life into a bunch of dirt and named him Adam. You think he can't teleport you? He made the sun and the stars and the universe that we see. He can't translate you? Oh, he did it with one guy. He can't do it with millions? How weak is your God? These people, they mock what they don't know. Now, we, we mentioned this here in passing at the end. And I, admittedly, I'm going to give you a little precursor. This is a little bit of addition. This is a little bit of something extra I want to mention, okay? I actually have my own personal theory here with this, and I can't prove it biblically. And so typically I wouldn't bring these out, but I do find this interesting. This is my own personal belief and my own personal theory uh, upon studying this, not just yesterday, but you know, over the past several months and even years when we talk about prophecy. I, I've come to notice something that's really interesting here. And knowing what I do about Israel and the church, knowing what I do about the Bible, there's a real interesting thing going on here, I believe, in Genesis 5 and 6 and onward here, and when we talk about the flood. So what happens with Enoch? You ever wondered why this is in the Bible? Why is that here? It's it, it kind of random. Why did God choose Enoch out of all the people that worshipped him at that time? Why is God taking this one guy and then making a big deal in Hebrews about it by faith, right? By faith, by faith, by faith. You can't do it without God, without without faith. God's not going to be pleased. He makes a big deal in Hebrews about Enoch having faith. Then he has Enoch being being raptured prior to what? What, what happened after Enoch was raptured? The flood came. Yeah, the flood. Worldwide flood. You could, you could say wrath of God. So you have Enoch that by faith pleased God walk with God in his rapture, you have that in the New Testament, a direct parallel known as the rapture of the church. Now, who is kept in the ark through the flood? Noah and his family. Now, what's interesting to me is, to me, I very clearly believe you can see in that Enoch as a type of the church yes. And, yes. And, and, and Noah as a type of Israel. Yes. Because Israel is going to be kept through the tribulation. They're going to flee and be kept safe you read Revelation 12, a lot of people think it's Petra. They're going to flee and be kept safe from Satan during the tribulation right. period. The church will be already be translated. You see this? That, that to me is a really interesting thing that God did here in the Old Testament. All the way back at the beginning. Yep. And, and think about the mind of the Lord now. If I'm right about that, think about the mind of God that from the very beginning, he uses Enoch as a picture of the church being translated and raptured out then uses Noah and his family as a picture of Israel being kept through a period of God's wrath on earth. That's amazing. You say, well, you know, I don't believe that. Well, you can't, you can't deny that it ain't, it ain't interesting. You can't deny that it ain't similar. I think that's pretty similar. And, you know, I think, I think if you look at it with spiritual eyes, you, you might see the same thing I do. Yep. And I, th I think that's a pretty interesting thing to take note of. You know, and the, main, the main point here is this. You know, when we talk about raptures in the Bible, I'll get through more of them next time, Lord willing, because there's more than one. Yes. It's not just Enoch. There's yeah. other times when people on earth are caught up and taken somewhere. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, Enoch was caught up and taken to heaven, right? And we, I, can, I can list them now, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. There's more people in the Bible that are caught up and taken somewhere. Right. Not every time to heaven, but there's sometimes that they are. And so next time, you know, Lord willing, I'm going to go into more and talk more about the reality of the rapture. And what I'm proving here is the nature of the rapture is not some new thing. Oh, it's the first time in history God's ever going to translate somebody or take them away. No, it ain't. He's done it before. He's going to do it again. Right. And then, you know, Lord will, maybe at the end of the series, I'll talk more about the confusion on the timing of the rapture and stuff like that. We'll just have to see. Now, Lord willing, tonight I'll be going over First Thessalonians 4, the first four verses, and be getting into a little bit of this issue on uh, election, and we're going to talk a little bit about Israel. And there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, You've got you to bring your mind to these kind of studies, but it's very interesting studies. And uh, so, you know, just, just pray that God gives me clarity of speech this evening, because this evening's sermon... I think it should be very interesting as well. Hopefully this one was encouraging to you. You know, and like I said before, if, if somebody didn't know that they were a Christian and you study that you're, you're listening to a topic on the rapture and you think of this worldwide event that will take place where all hell begins to break loose on earth and God's wrath begins to be poured out and Antichrist begins to persecute people, you know, that's not a period of time I'd want to be in. And you, some people might look at this and say, well, that just sounds too good to be true. All I got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, trust him as my Savior, and I don't have to go through all this? Yes, exactly. The Bible says it's by faith, not of works. That's how simple salvation is. And, and if somebody listening here, or somebody even here today for whatever reason, you know, if Walker would actually pay attention and listen to the message, he could call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he would be forgiven of his sins. Past, present, and future. There's not a time when you call on the name of the Lord and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, he will do it. The Bible says that all who come to him, he'll no wise cast away. And so the door is wide open. Today's the day to believe, right? right. Today's the day of salvation. Now, while you hear his voice, harden not your heart. But, but instead, accept the Lord Jesus in your heart. And, and some Calvinists, oh, you don't believe Jesus will be in your heart. Ephesians says so. Read your Bible. He dwells in your heart by faith. And you can have Christ dwell in you. And you can, you can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. You can be sealed until the day of redemption. If you would just trust Jesus as your Savior, you, you don't get to earn your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. Salvation is a free gift. What I read in Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please God. The opposite of faith is works. You can't keep the commandments. You can't do good enough. And thanks be to God, he did it all. Jesus paid for your sins on the cross. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. And if you believe on him, you can be forgiven of your sins. And you'll be numbered in these people that will one day partake in this rapture. You say, well, what if I die first? Well, you'll, you'll rise first. That's what, that's what First Thessalonians said. You die first, you rise first. Right. But if you're there, you won't see death. I guess that's a consolation, you know. They get a rise first. We don't have to see death. I, I would take the death part. I don't want to see death. I'll take that one more than rising first, but, you know, yeah. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, I, I thank you for your word, and I, I, I pray and hope that I rightly divided it. I believe I did, and I, I love the rapture, and I look forward to that day. And it, it's, it's even more exciting now, and I have that blessed hope, rather than thinking I'm going to go through the whole tribulation period, to know that one day you will actually rapture us away from here, and take us to be with you uh, is actually an amazing thing. To know that that's the next thing to look forward to is a great, a great hope. And uh, I look forward to that blessed hope, um, not to a blessed period of wrath from Antichrist. And I look forward to the day when you rapture your church. And God, I, I pray as the message goes forth, if, if somebody online has listened and they're convicted and they know that they need you and they know, they know they need forgiving their sins, I pray, God, that you would draw them and cleanse them of their sin as they call on your name and ask to be forgiven of their sins, God. I thank you, God, for your strong and powerful, mighty word as it goes forth. I know it wields a sword that, that cuts asunder men's hearts and shows them their need for you. And it's not my words, it's your word. And it, it's not my power and my strength, it's your spirit and your strength that convicts people. And so, God, I, I pray today that as the message goes forth, you would convict people of their sin and their need for your son. And God, as you encourage your Christians and your people here, that there is a day coming when we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And, you know, as we sang this morning, we'll fly away. Uh, you know, 
this weary days, as this body, you know, gets weary and corrupted, one day we'll put on incorruptible. Yeah. Help us, uh, Lord, to long for that day all the more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.